Evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to continue our study through the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 30. Why don't we open in prayer and we'll get right into the word tonight. Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to open our Bibles and to study your word. And we pray, God, that tonight you would speak to our hearts. Lord, this portion of scripture that we're looking at tonight gives us a lot of practical teachings on a lot of practical points for our life, Father God. I call them life lessons. So, Father, help us to heed them and apply them to our lives for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, and together we'd say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, Genesis chapter 30, we left off at at verse 25. You will recall the first part of chapter 20. Uh, Jacob is in, in, uh, I called it the battle of the babies. Right? The two sisters and the two concubines having all these children. At this point, he's got 11 sons and at least one daughter. And uh, he's been serving his father-in-law now for, for 14 years, the agreed-upon time for uh, the dowry for the, the girls, for his wives. And so as we take from there, it says in verse 25 of chapter 30 of Genesis, it says, And it came to pass when Rachel bore, had born Joseph, now, Joseph will be the next patriarch that the Bible will follow after Jacob. But after Joseph was born, that Jacob said to Laban, his, interesting, you would think this is from Tennessee. It's his uncle slash father-in-law. <laughs> but he says to him, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Seeing how he was the servant of his father-in-law and in dentured to him all that he had to properly be dismissed to be able to go home now his time of service agreed upon service had been completed so everything was set for him to do that so he asked to go and he says in verse 26 give me my wives and my children again he's got 11 boys at this point and at least one daughter for whom I have served you and let me go for you know my service for which I have done for you so he's saying I have completed the agreed upon um terms now it's time for for me to go home now notice verse 27 this is very interesting Laban says to him please stay for I have if I have found favor in your eyes for I have learned by experience next to that word experience write the word divination now in the margin of your Bible it might have the word divination I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me for your sake we're going to find in these scriptures that we look at tonight that Laban was not a follower of Jehovah. Jacob's relationship to God is kind of shaky at best until we get to the end of the story, right? right? But they practice, and we're going to see here, they practice divination. They practice the seeking of other gods. And it's very interesting, even these other gods had told him, the reason you are successful is because of this young man, your son-in-law, right? And so here he has learned that. Now, why has God told us we are not to be involved in these type of practices such as divination, fortune telling, palm reading, astrology, and all those things. Are very, they're strictly forbidden in scripture. Well, the reason being is because we're taught in scripture that the people who, who um, believe in them, they're trusting in evil or demonic forces instead of trusting in God. I'm going to give you just a couple of scriptures. You can write them down. We're not going to read them. But Leviticus chapter 19 verses 26 through 31 gives us that. And I will have you turn, just forward in your Bible, a few pages, to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 18. And we're going to read verse 10. Actually, verse 9 through 14. When you get there, just say amen. amen. Sounds like everyone's there. Let's start reading. God is giving instructions to his people. Now, if you're a Christian, you're a people of God, right? He says, and when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, in today's lingo, we'd say something like this. When you come into a personal relationship with, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are learning and you're growing in God, you shall not learn to follow the abomination of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, can't kill babies, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. A lot of that stuff going on today, aren't there? There's a big church located in, uh, in California that practices this, this occult practice called grave soaking, or grave sucking. You, you heard of that? They go to the grave of, of famous dead uh, 
Christians and they lay on it and they, they, have, they, they suck up their mojo, their, their, oh, their spirit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not going to tell you what church it is, but their initials are Bethel. <laughs> and uh, they're very, very big into this, this stuff. Uh, something that really broke my heart this week, I learned that uh, the actor in the movie, Jesus Revolution, which I love the movie, I highly encourage you, you to see it. It's a great movie, great movie. But the young man who played the, the, the guy, um, Alani, who also plays Jesus in the Chosen series, he practices grave sucking. Yeah, isn't that a bummer? It's like, oh, man. They, they call it by both names, soaking and sucking. Okay, anyway, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, it's an abomination before the, the eyes of the Lord, verse 13. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 12. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. If you practice these things that God says you're not to practice, you are an abomination to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I got enough trouble <laughs> than, than to get God mad at me like that, right? Now, I do read fortune cookies. And then I repent. <laughs> but it's usually repenting from gluttony. Anyway, uh, because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Friends, that is an important thing there. What God is saying here is these things I've delivered you from, don't go back to them. Now, this is something that needs to be preached in churches today, not just, not just occultic practices and stuff like that, but any sin. When God saves us and delivers us and sets us free, don't go back. Amen. Don't go back. Now, it might not be something as bad as some of these things listed. It could be something that the world might call, uh, you know, just a little sin or something like that. Don't go back. God says, I've, I've called you out of that. And you're not to, you're not to, to put yourself back, back in that. I tell people, if you struggle with alcohol, man, don't go to karaoke night down at the water. <coughs> don't, don't expose yourself to things that will cause you more problems. Amen? Amen. All right. So he goes on to say, uh, verse 13, verse 12, I'm still in verse 12. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. God delivers us. Notice verse 13. Because God has delivered us, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispose, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such to you. The next time a person who claims to be a Christian is in, invites you over you know, to play on the Ouija board and stuff like that, uh, you can rest assured God did not instruct them to do that. Amen? All right. Let's keep going back to our text here in Genesis. He says, I've learned by, by divination that, that God has blessed me because of you. Another side note, the Bible teaches us that, uh, that other people will be blessed by the fruits of our hands, by the fruits of our labor. A good scripture for that is Deuteronomy 28.4. If we are a Christian and we're an employee, we should be the best employee that company has. It's, it's a real shame. I've heard on a couple of occasions, uh, young people who are waiters and waitresses, they dread Sunday afternoons because people come, they, they leave church where they worship God, and then they come chew out the, the, the waitress. That's horrible, friends. That's why I don't go out to eat. <laughs> Let's get back to our, our stuff here. Verse 28, he says, I know that, that, that I am blessed because of you, verse 28, and then he said, name me your wages and I'll give it. Okay? He, he says, you're making me rich. I want to keep you around. What do you want? So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock have been with me. You know I have paid my debt. I have served you these 14 years. You have now seen how, how much your, your, your livestock have multiplied. Verse 30, for what you have had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. And the Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now... When shall I also provide for my own house? What he's saying is, you know, I can't keep working for you because I keep making you rich, keep making you rich, keep making you rich, and I ain't got nothing. I, you, you didn't know he was in the funeral business, did you? <laughs> Verse 31. And so he said, what shall I give you? He still, you know, he's, he's, <laughs> he doesn't care about his daughters or grandkids, but he cares about that money. What shall I give you? And so Jacob said, you can't give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I won't take your money, but here's what I'll do. I will again feed and keep your flocks if you agree to this thing. And here's, his, here's what he lays out, verse 32. Let me pass through all of your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all that 
all the brown ones among the lambs, and the spotted and the speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. Now, primarily these, these goats and lambs were, were solid colors. And so it was very rare to have a, a spotted or streaked one, two or three colored one. So he says, you let me take the, the, the least valuable ones from there, the ones that aren't worth as much, and let them be mine. So that's not a bad deal. And he continues in verse 33 saying, And so my righteousness will be an answer for me in time to come. When the subject of my wages comes before you, everyone that is not speckled or spotted among the goats and the browns among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. What he's saying is then at the end of breeding and birthing season when all the babies are out there, if there are any that, that are not spotted or speckled in my herd, they'll be considered stolen and be returned to you. Well, Laban, you know, he's, he's greedy. So he says in verse 34, so he says, Oh, that it were according to your word. That's his way of saying, we got a deal. So the, uh, the, they make this deal, but true to his nature, look what Laban does. So he, this is Laban, removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs and gave them to us to the hands of his sons, and they put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. You see what he did there? He made the agreement. You can have all the spotted and speckled goats and lambs uh, from today on, and they'll be yours. And so what he does is he, he secretly tells his boys, go get all the spotted and speckled ones out of there. So he's already ripping them off. Now, if there's no spotted or speckled ones in there, when they go to, to, to breed and multiply, there, there's no chance of that. You see how this rascal keeps ripping him off? But one thing that Laban doesn't understand, is the, and he's just confessed it, and that is that the God of, his, of, of Jacob's father, the God of Abraham, is with him. And friends, how many of you know that God can do the impossible? Amen. I love the very, it's a very, sometimes I think some of the stories in the Bible are so common that we lose the power of them. But let me take you back to the Christmas story when the angel's talking to Mary about giving birth to the baby Jesus. And Mary goes, well, how can this happen? I, I, I don't know a man. I've never been physical with a man. And, you know, I know a little bit about biology. And what did the angel say? Friends, never forget this. With God, nothing shall be impossible. God is not bound to the things that man is bound by. God's not bound by the laws of what we call the laws of nature because he created them, right? Amen. God is the God of the incredible. Well, he takes them on. He, he takes them about, about 50 miles away, and, and they're moving along. So now he's got to take care of all this flock. Verse uh, 37 uh, says, Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of almonds and chestnut trees. He peeled white stripes in them, and he exposed white white which was in the rod so this is kind of a superstitious move and a lot of bible teachers have difference of, of opinion here but the bible is like a newspaper back when newspapers were legit and that was it just records the facts right what he does he takes these sticks from different trees and he peels stripes in them and takes part of the bark off so that the inside wood is exposed and the inside wood is white and so he takes these sticks, and it says in verse 38, these rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs were in the flock. Over and over and over again, friends, and this is the worst thing people can do. Something bad happens, some, something doesn't go right and all this. People will remove themselves from, from church. They'll remove themselves from the fellowship of the believers, and that is the worst thing you can do. A pastor, those people are crazy. You ain't got to tell me. I'm the pastor. I know they're crazy. <laughs> but you still need to be here. One more crazy person ain't going to make a difference. But you, you see what God is saying? Amen. And we don't want, we, you don't want to run away from God. Amen. We don't want to run to God. So God tells him, I'm the God of Bethel. I'm, it's time for you to arise and go. Verse 14. And this is amazing. Then Rachel and Leah, okay, the two sisters that were always button heads, they answered and said to him, Is there still any portion of our inheritance for us in our father's house? 
Dad has written us off, off too. Verse 15, are we not considered strangers by him? The relationship, because of his hatred towards, towards Jacob, he, he's written off his own kids. Yeah, it is sad. For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. You see, part of the bride price was set aside for the bride. The, the, the family got it, but, but the bride got part of it back. Dad ripped his own kids off. Yeah. Verse 16, for all these riches was, which God has taken from our family are, uh, are really ours and our children's. Now then, now listen to what these two pagan girls that are fighting say. Whatever God has said to you, do it. Amen. Friends, I'm going I'm to make a little statement here. God knows how appreciative I am that I have a spouse that loves God and trusts me, even when sometimes I maybe not make the right and the best decisions. I mean, I know a lot of ministers who, who fight that battle, and it's a, I'm so grateful to God I don't have to fight that battle. Now, I don't know if she's watching tonight, but if, if, if I got a great dessert waiting for him when I get home. <laughs> But, but I, I, it's true, isn't it? I mean, how, how true is that when, when spouses are in agreement? Amen. Wow, what a difference it makes. And here are these girls. They say, do it. And home life hadn't been that great for them. Remember, they're always fighting and comparing kids and, you know. He agrees with the, the, the horses are coming. <laughs> Verse 17. So Jacob arose, and he, he set his sons and his wife on, on camels. So he, he's loading them up. He doesn't he, he, he mess around. He's loading them up. And he carried away all his livestock and all his possessions, which he had gained, uh, his acquired livestock, which he had gained in, in Paid and Aram. And he, he, he's going home to Isaac and to the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols. Next to this, your Bible might say the word teraphim. These were little idols that households would have and they were little pagan idols and and she swipes them now i don't know why she did it but she did she swipes them and uh verse 20 so laban i have to come back here. Uh, so laban uh stole away unknowingly to laban the syrian in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and he crossed the river and he headed towards the mountains of Gilead. So he's, he doesn't say anything. He just packs up and goes home. I missed a couple of things that I think is important here. Verse 3 of this chapter says, And the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and your family, and I will be with you. I have three things here that um, will, well, let me read it. Many times we might find ourselves in a place or situ situation and wonder if God is trying to get us to move. Maybe in our profession, our ministry, or geographically, here in this text we get three hints from the Bible that, that will tell us if it's time to move on. The first one we found in verse 2, and that is, I've entitled, The River Dries Up. Now, I take that from the prophet who was getting fed by ravens and drank his water by, by the, the brook, right? And God told him to leave. What did he do? He just kept sipping the cool water and eating the food. So what did God do? Dried up, Dried up the brook. How does, how does that happen for him? Well, daddy-in-law is no longer nice to him. The smile is now a frown. God's making him uncomfortable in the situation. Sometimes God might have to dry up your river to, to get you to obey him. The second thing we see is in verse 3, and that is that God uh, uh, reinitiates our call. Look at verse 3. This promise was made 20 years earlier. Now, sometimes what will happen, have you guys noticed this, that God is dealing with you and you're not sure if it's God's will or not? And everything you do, everything you hear, everyone you talk to mentions it. Every song on Christian radio speaks of it. Every preacher on the radio speaking of it. People mention it. God reaffirming what he has already spoken to your heart. Amen. And thirdly, we found in verse 16. Verse 16, it says, And all these riches with, 
which God has taken from our Father are already ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to do, do it. And this is the third one, and that is that people will confirm for us. Proverbs 11:14 says this, that God will grant great wisdom, for in the multitude of counselors, there's great wisdom. Sometimes someone will say something that will just confirm what God has put in your heart, and you're, it just goes, boom, that's what I needed, right? Mm-hmm. All right, that was a little side note. Let's, let's go back to our story here. I've got to get back to where I was here. Uh, verse 22, well, Laban finds this out on the third day. You know, he's out shearing his sheep, and he's told that, that uh, Jacob had taken off. Huh? So verse 23, so he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey, and he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. Again, he's heading home. Verse 24, I love this. But God came to Laban, in the Syrian, in a dream by night. Now, he's come to do some harm. And God's going to defend his boy. He comes to him in a dream and he says to him, Hey, hey, dude, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. Don't try to up his wages and buy him back. And don't threaten him. He's my boy and he's going home. Verse 25, so Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched, their, pitched theirs in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have stole, stolen away, uh, unknown to me, and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Well, well, he's saying, My girl surely wouldn't come to you voluntarily. You, 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 you kidnapped them. Well, that was wrong. Verse 27, why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? Uh, because you're a loser. <laughs> that I might have sent you away with joy and songs and timbrels and harp. Yeah, right. 20 years he's never had a party. Now you're going to a party? <laughs> and you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. These would be grandsons. Hmm. Daughters and granddaughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. Now, I have to be honest with you. Here he's scolding Jacob, and I'm thinking, just last night God told you not to do this. Mm -hmm. But the flesh is something, right? Verse 29, he, he, he comes right out and he says, it's in my power to do you harm. I came here to take my girls, my grandkids, and to wipe you out. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. He comes right out and says, I came here with destruction in mind. And if it wasn't for your God, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? So he's saying, okay, you know, I can't force you back because your God is stopping me. You've taken what's yours, but why did you steal my gods? Now, Rachel did take them. But Jacob didn't know it. Well, Jacob now, he's got 20 years of aggravation bubbling up. And it finally pops. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Perhaps you you would take your, your daughters from me by force. With whomever you find your gods, do not let them live in the presence of your of our brethren. Identify what I have of of yours and taking it with you for Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen him what he says is I didn't take anything from you have a look if you find anything of yours in here you can have it back and you can you can you can wipe out whoever took it verse 33 so Laban went into Jacob's tent into Leah's tent and into the two maids tent but he did not find them and he went out of Leah's tent and he entered Rachel's tent now Rachel had taken the household idols these teraphims Uh, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. That was very disrespectful for God. (laughs) Which tells us she didn't really respect these gods. So I don't know, I'm not really sure why she took them. There's some different Bible teachers have different ideas. But she took them. And now dad's searching the whole thing in the tent, but didn't find them. So she says to her dad in verse 35, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the man or woman is with me. I'm... I'm menstruating, so I can't, I can't stand up. Now, putting these fake gods in a saddlebag, sitting on them, and especially if you were menstruating, that's really disrespecting these gods, right? 
And so he left her alone, sitting on the saddle, and he searched, but he couldn't find the, the household idols. Verse 36, now Jacob was angry. He was mad. And he, let me get to the right page here. That word angry, in the original, it literally, literally means to burn with great indignation. 20 years it comes to the surface. And he rebuked Laban. King James said he chod, C-H-O-D-E. It means to tear into. He lets him have it. God told Laban, you can't yell at him. He didn't tell Jacob, you can't yell at him. So he starts yelling at him. He says, what is my trespass? What is my sin? What have you so hotly why have you so hotly pursued me? Although, although you have searched all my things, what part of your household have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us. Okay, am I ripping you off? Produce it. Where, where is it? Put it right here in front. We all can see you. Now he really gets at it. Look at verse 38. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. Okay, that would be a sign of, of not treating them well, them not eating well. They were healthy. They had healthy babies. He said, he said I took good care of them. Uh, they didn't miscarry their young. I have not eaten the rams of your flock. It was part of the herdsmen had the right to, to eat from the flock. As part of the wages. He didn't take that. Verse 39, that which was torn by beast, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. Right? The, the, the law stated that if, if an animal took one of the, the herd, the owner suffered the loss, not the shepherd, not the herdsman. A couple of scriptures, Exodus 22.12 and Amos 3.12, says that the shepherd was exonerated uh, if he brought the remains of the, the torn beast back to the shepherd, right? So he says, even when an animal got one of the babies, I replaced it. You required it from my hand, he says, whether st stolen by day or stolen by night. Look at verse 40. He said, there I was. In the day, the drought consumed me. The frost by night, my sleep departed from my eyes. Again, I told you, he's an undertaker. <laughs> He said, man, I was open to the elements. You're living in the tent. I'm out in the desert. Am I complaining? No. Verse 41. Therefore I have been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you have changed my wages 10 times. He is throwing it down, isn't it? And look what he says in verse 42. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely by now you would have sent me away empty-handed. And here's, here he's given God the credit. God has seen my afflictions and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. He has thrown it down. Verse 43. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters and these children are my children and this flock is my flock. Now, that's a lie. He served seven years for each daughter and six years for the flocks, right? So here, here old Laban is still lying about it. He's worked 20 years for all that he has. He says, but what can I do this day to these daughters or to their children whom they have bore? Verse 44, now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let, let it be witnesses between you and me. I think he had his light bulb moment that, ooh, I'm caught. So to make nice, nice, let's make a covenant and just call it even. So Jacob took a stone and he set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a heap. And they ate there on top of the heap. So they make this formal uh, covenant that is sealed by a, a meal. Verse 47, uh, Laban called it, um, I, I can't pronounce that. I, I keep saying Jägermeister, and I know it's not Jägermeister. <laughs> but in Aramaic, it means heap of witness. That's his tongue. But Jacob called it Galad, which in Hebrew means heap of witness. So it was, it was called heap of witness. They just said it in their own language. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name is called Gilead, also called Mizpah. Now, this is interesting. Mizpah means watchtower. And that phrase 
kind of morphed into a, a nice benediction when people would leave saying, you know, may, may our agreement be a love and watch out for each other and in positive. But back in that day, it was a threat. May it be the watchtower that if you cross this, I'll get you. If I cross it, you can get me, right? So they said, yeah, we're going to play nice, nice, but we ain't going to trust each other. Still in verse 49, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. Verse 50, if you afflict my daughters or if, or if you take other wives beside my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Now all of a sudden he's concerned about his daughters. He's already proved he didn't care, right? But now all of a sudden he's the, the dad of the century. Verse 51, then Laban said to Jacob, here is the heap and here is the pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for any harm. Verse 53, the God of Abraham, the God of, of Nahor, the God of, of their father judge between us and Jacob swore by the fear of the father of Isaac and Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread, and they ate bread, and they stayed all night in the mountain. And in the early morning, Laban arose. He kissed his sons, this would be grandsons, and his daughters, and blessed them. And then Laban departed and returned to his place. Now, once he departs and returns to his place, he actually, uh, and he, he goes without his God, he really vanishes from the biblical record. We have no more from him. I want to stop there for the night because he's, our boy Jacob has gotten away from his fa bad father-in-law, but now he's got to meet mad brother. And he'll meet mad brother then next week. Sound good? All right, we'll pray. We'll dismiss the streaming audience. And then if we have any conversation or anything, questions, we can get into that here in the sanctuary. Those who are watching us by streaming, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you guys. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the study of your word. May we heed your word tonight, Lord God. Father, may we trust you in all things. Father, may we move and walk and have our being in faith and not in fear. Father, may we truly, truly be the sheep of your pasture. May we truly be a blessing to the world. Use us, Father, to bring your good message to a needful world. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.